Thanks to Cesar, uh, Lauren, and Christine, and we'll now invite uh, our uh, panelists up for conversation. Uh, there we go. Uh, so I'll int introduce everyone. Um, we have Jonas on the end, Jonas Yanomagi from the Interactive Advertising Bureau. He's been with them, working with them since uh, 2017. And prior to that was head of media strategy and operations uh, and head of media at REA uh, Group. Uh, his digital career began in a startup in 1999 uh, and then went on to found Web Ads UK, a specialist business and financial digital sales house, and then moved to High Media, Europe's largest independent ad network with access to almost uh, more than 150 million unique users. Uh, he's been in Australia since 2012. Uh, welcome, Jonas. Uh, and uh, Charmaine Griffiths, uh, here uh, next to me, is the growth director for Australia and New, Ze New Zealand at VML YMR a global marketing, communication, and advertising company with a his rich history stretching back to the 1920s. I think that's right, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Australia's oldest ad agency, yeah. Uh, Charmaine has over nine years of experience spanning creative, media, and consulting sectors, and as growth director, focuses on identifying and unlocking new business opportunities in a fast-paced landscape of media and entertainment. Uh, just down the end here is Richard Warwick, um, uh, head of digital and partner at Custom Media, a Sydney-based independent media agency. And Richard has worked in digital advertising for over 10 years, helping a diverse range of organizations develop effective advertising strategies, execute and measure success across digital channels. Uh, and Jean Burgess, uh, the Associate Director of the ARC Center of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society uh, here with us as well on the panel. Uh, so I wanted to start off um, by, by saying we're quite familiar, I think, in a general sense with this idea that digital platforms collect our data and they use that data to target ads. Uh, but I wanted to um, ask each of you who've been working in the industry over the last decade or more, um, how has this story developed and changed? And, and particularly, what do you see as the, the crucial developments or the crucial moments of change in, the, in, in recent history? I'd like to go first. Get us underway. Richard. Thank you. Yeah, we're on. Sorry, just muted it. Yep. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, so look, from, from my perspective, I think there's been a, a tremendous amount of change over the last five years, and I expect that change to continue uh, for at least the next three or four years. There's obviously been big adjustments in terms of the landscape uh, locally and internationally, uh, and things like uh, changes to privacy laws, which we know are imminent, are also going to have a big factor in terms of uh, the types of campaigns that we run and how we run them. Uh, but from my perspective, one of the biggest changes has probably been a shift from a performance mentality amongst a lot of advertisers to more, I guess, old fashioned brand marketing and to not be so reliant on uh, metric things that you can measure easily through digital platforms and move back towards uh, more holistic measures of success. Uh, so business growth and overall sales and things like that. And I, I think how that relates to, to the work that you're doing is probably a lot of the systems that, um, you know, platforms such as Meta and Alphabet have set up is they, they're gonna need to change to be less specific in how they target people and, and be much more general in terms of that approach. And as advertisers, probably to uh, be a bit more a um, bit less obsessed with, I want to be really targeted about who I'm reaching and I want to send this specific message to this per person and, in, and instead go back to thinking about broad groups of population and how we're going to reach them and, and message and, them. And would you say it's driven by two things? One is the, the um, changes in the privacy landscape, but also, um, you know, advertisers are measuring really specific things because platforms were letting them and now they're reflecting on that and saying, wait a second, What's the value of it? Absolutely. It, it doesn't work. Um, right. So that performance mentality uh, it, it has been bad. Um, it's, it's gone down a path where instead of actually thinking about what ads we're showing people and, and how people might respond to that, it's, well, if the system tells us that we're getting one person clicking on it, a click is a good thing, therefore we'll try and get more of those. And it, it leads to these kind of perverse outcomes where you, you're showing ads to people based on their probability to click on it, which a probability to click isn't a level of engagement or interest that has a positive, positive business benefit. So I think it's, I think it's marketers waking up to, to that. And I think that those of us in the industry have been trying for a long time to move them back, you know, 
back towards the light in terms of where you should be uh, spending your money. Uh, the, the other factor is is on it, the, the commercial side is um, consumption across traditional channels is going down as, as people know, uh, but there's still big advertising budgets that need to go somewhere. So a lot of money that used to go into things like TV uh, is now going towards digital and advertisers want the same outcomes they used to get from TV in digital environments. So platforms, if they want to get some of that money, they have to offer solutions that are more similar to what advertisers were getting from TV. And I think platforms mm. are getting smarter about, hey, it's not, we don't get growth through being increasingly targeted. Mm. We get growth through scale. So we need to be able to provide impactful messages at scale to advertisers. Yeah. Uh, Shami? Oh, no, it's, it's on. Oh, I've muted myself. Oh, Brilliant. Yes. Um, yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with everything you just said. There, there used to be a um, very tired joke in a lot of the agencies that I worked in um, that, oh, I just wish we could go back to when the Australian Women's Weekly reached a million people and you could just buy that one ad and reach a million people. So the, the game that we've always been in is reach. Um, we wish that it was easier. We wish that we could buy one TV ad and, you know, still reach a couple of million Australians. I think we all got very excited there on, you know, the industry is built on art and science, on the science side of it. Um, we all got very excited for a number of years of, um, you know, hyper-targeting. But really, when you come back to it, reach is what we need to do. Um, and I think that the balance of, you know, traditional channels losing the volume of people that you need to be effective at scale, digital platforms starting to scale up has seen something very interesting on the, the art side of the industry. Um, so often there was a consideration that, a, you know, a TV screen was a greater canvas or a more impactful canvas or a canvas that you'd be excited to show your mum that you'd had, you know, made an amazing ad for. Um, and then social media, because it was dark, it wasn't reaching a lot of people, was not something that that you know, creatives were really drawn to. I think that I always talked about it as sort of horizontal creatives and vertical creatives, and there was a real distinction in the industry for a long time. I think we're finally at a point now where the um, vertical creatives are seen as as prestigious and impactful as um, your horizontal creatives as well. So we've always been in the game of reach. It's just now that getting that reach and getting that scale and kind of playing in the dark arts of digital and what you can do there is a lot more sophisticated and nuanced. Yeah, but this, this has been part of an evolutionary process, I think based upon the capabilities driven by the, the benefits of programmatic in particular as a mechanism to, to be more efficient and effective, to integrate data of all types, shapes and sizes into what you're doing, to have more controls for both buyers and sellers. I mean, we're, we're, I think you need to look back a little bit to see how we've reached this point um, because the, the obsession and the kind of overreach that we've had with audience data in particular is, it, it feels a little sinful, but it's actually a natural pro progression because of the capabilities that existed. I have a specific distinct memory myself at around 2010 when representing, I'd like to think, some fairly significant premium audiences and in inventory and understanding that buyers through demand demand side platforms buying technologies and the data integration is available therein had a greater understanding of the audiences I was supposed to be representing and providing so it was kind of natural that um, there was going to be a bit of an obsession of just trying to find that uh, that individual with that level of intent for a particular product anywhere on the internet without going back to that sort of premium curated audience piece which which was so prevalent particularly in the sort of mid noughties um, so yeah, yes we've had to learn from that and there's we're sort of growing up and maturing um, as an industry as a result but th I think there's some there's some reason for that and we've learned a lot from it um, the, the the topics that I think are coming as a result are in relation to transparency which was a was a big topic for particularly brands that pushed it in terms of understanding who they're dealing with why why buys are being constructed in a certain way who's taking a clip of the ticket and that is a topic that resonates still now there's a global um effort from um, the ana re report that came out only about a month ago i think that like they're still looking at it there's still an element of murkiness in in some um quarters i personally believe the the, po the, the ability to show transparent paths and the standards underpinned by the likes of the ib do exist it, 
that commitment can be there. The um, the declaration uh, to sort of declare yourself as a participant within programmatic campaigns is is possible. You can see all the hops all the way through. So, um, and actually, to Christine's um, point on sustainability, that's something that's going to take transparency to the next level because brands have an expectation that the scope three emissions of their partners with whom they work with need to be as minimized and as manageable actually as possible. So that's a topic that's coming. Bits of the industry are running at different speeds, but therefore you need to know he's involved and you need to be able to pass those emission signals through all the transactions and, and measure it consistently. Um, and that's a very interesting development that we're, that we're currently seeing. And just to, just to mention the, the point um, made earlier around that sort of linear TV experience, the change in consumer experiences, because it's incredible, because the way in which you have addressable televisions in your home and you can deliver the benefits of linear TV and the controls and capabilities of programmatic has had a real shift recently that I think um, there is a bit of a comeback in terms of that branding and attention and engagement. Um, that's very true. And audio's come of age. That's that's a, that is happening and it's it's wonderful to see and even out of home big digital addressable screens whilst the whilst the audit whilst the footfall slightly inferred um you're still being able to have more controls um over the opportunities that you're providing to consumers on those screens so it's quite an interesting point that we've that we've come to but i think there's something in the history of how we got here that's important yeah. to yeah. to remember can I, I, uh, I think it's really interesting this idea that um, this hyper-targeted moment is, you know, to be blunt, sort of over and we're moving into another moment. And, you know, I was thinking a little bit this year the way Meta's ad interface shifted away from, you know, like a decade ago you would log into the ad creator as a small business and you get, you know, you'd have to say, I want these people of this age with this interest. Like it, it led you to think in a hyper-targeted way. But, but this year they've kind of dropped all that language and the ad creator really just uses the language of lookalikes. And so I just wanted to ask this question about what does in this moment audience optimization, um, refining, creating uh, the right kind of audiences for advertisers look like now? Uh, what kind of data matters? What does it mean to optimize an audience over time? Um, yeah, maybe if I come back to you, Richard. Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's it's certainly less prescriptive than it used to be. So at, at the moment, it's, it's much more, uh, I, I guess, broader. So if we use Facebook as an example, that was the, that was like the, the, the play thing that after what well, I guess was 2015 or the, the, the Trump campaign essentially right. killed that for everyone yeah. um, because they, they were too targeted. They ran too many ads and Facebook had a lot of pressure to say, you can't let people run campaigns like this. Yeah. Um, and so the, the shift has been away from, okay, we, we need a million different ads for a million different potential audiences to being much more general now the the issue that, that i guess we have and one of the issues that, that you're looking into is um those if we're being less prescriptive we don't understand those audiences as well as we used to because at least we would go okay we're really confident we're reaching this type of person and this message is appropriate for that that type of person to say you know men 18 to 34 that like cars for instance um, <clears throat> whereas they're moving to things like lookalike uh, audiences where the idea is you would in you would give Facebook your data in terms of here's all these people that are our customers or we know are really you know hot prospects for us and you can go out and model and, and find those and we don't really need to understand who you who you're going after and that's bad for for media buyers obviously because mm -hmm. we want to understand who that is because we don't want to be reliant on Facebook right. all the time to 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 um, find that audience, and we want to be able to to build on it and and spread that out across other platforms and environments as well. So, I'd say that's sort of where we are at the moment, and the way things the place the place we're heading is uh, more and more obscurity, and and so that's something that I think is is going to be an issue, and probably something that that will be a focus of your work moving forward. Right. Just yeah, want to jump in. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, so the, the 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 capabilities of hyper targeting within certain environments are, in my opinion, as rich as ever. Um, it's just that companies are more responsible and mature, particularly the massive tech companies, because it's all privacy by design now. So there is a perception piece there, 
and that and there is a little bit of um if i'm allowed to say it sort of dumbing down of the process if you look at google's performance max product it's kind of a hit the button it's going to look it's going to get better but you don't actually know how the other the other point is signal loss so signal loss has been happening for a while apple ios huge limitations there safari has always been the case mozilla firefox has has pretty much always been the case um and then you've got the third party cookie um changes to come it's pretty much confirmed that chrome um will make that that decision in h2 sometime in h2 24 calendar year so that that's to come and that's another reason that you simply can't attribute as accurately so that's it's a reason for you not to be too performance at best because you you just don't know it's going to be sort of very cohort based so just bear that in mind because that's a, such a huge change that's that's coming Charmaine on this question of audience building this is quite a boring one but often the actual answers are, are, are a little bit boring um so if you think about the the operational cost so let's let's take ourselves back to the glory days of 15 years ago when you did one big television commercial you did a bit of um you know uh newspaper or magazines you know a much simpler time but if you think about the actual art of that so how many ad formats there were how many things you actually had to produce for a campaign it was it was quite small then we went through what i call the matching luggage phase um, which is you would start with the tv commercial and then all of the other different um, ad formats and platforms that had come online you would match that or sort of you know take the distinctive assets or the art that you've created for the tvc and flow that out across all of the other different platforms we've now evolved into this new moment where we're not starting with the tv commercial first because it's not the one that necessarily actually has the greatest reach anymore. So you're creating kind of um, a, a overarching look and feel and then deploying that specifically against the main kind of platforms or formats that you need. So if you do that, so say we've got four or five different, you know, articulations of the idea that's still more than you were doing 10, 15 years ago. If you then go down to the next level and decide, okay, of those four or five, I'm now gonna do extremely hyper-targeted versions of this. The operational cost to do that versus the effectiveness of what the advertiser gets back, it's it's really negligible and starts eating into your media dollars to get the reach that you need. Again, we're, we're, we're in the game of reach. Um, so that's, yeah, it's a slightly boring answer, but it's sort of a, an operational cost that comes to it, which is why I think you find with these um, kind of bottom-up performance um, uh, ad formats that are kind of pulling the creative together, I almost, I, I kind of call it like the Cluedo creative, you know, it's this distinctive asset, you know, Mrs. White in the drawing room with the gun. It's sort of this mega mix of all of the different distinctive assets coming together because for you know humans in an agency pulling that volume of creative together it's not a particularly um uh, it's a laborious um task and something that you know creatives and artistic people don't get a lot of impact out of and i don't think advertisers are getting the impact out of it either right um there are, please use your slider to post questions because we will go to questions soon um but i want to shift gears a little bit here and ask the question about generative ai and where it fits into this mix uh, if we're in one sense going more, um, you know, back to more mass broadcast kinds of creative and, and audience building and generative AI suggests a, a moment of now automating and customizing the content. Um, how do you see, how do you see gener generative AI being kind of integrated into ad, the ad world over the coming years? I'd like to, Jonas, Jonas? Yeah. I don't, uh, uh, would you like to say something? <laughs> you yeah. would. Yes. Well, I'm um, going to come to you, Gene. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, oh. you should. Yes. Oh, I was I was going to sit back and listen and then oh, no, I've got the microphone now. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we won't have time for questions. <laughs> uh, um I was going to uh, on the audience, you know, what audience are you buying as a product? Well, as an audience, we don't know how we're being bought either. And then I was going to wait till after the generative AI thing to ask this, but you know, there's yep. this broad question about responsible AI going on it involves things like explainability it involves things like um non uh non biased non predatory um actions by automated systems all things that brands care about you know you've got the idea of brand safety just in terms of ads being placed next to problematic content we can leave aside the definition of prob problematic so it strikes me that in our um, work that can be quite critical of the advertising industry. We have mm. some shared interests in terms of building tools for just yeah. understanding what's going on. So I was gonna, yeah, I don't know if like, maybe you wanna fold that into some of your answers. Yeah. yeah. 
What we'll do is we'll just take over, Gene. You you <laughs> ask the questions, right? We'll answer it. <laughs> Hooray! There's a bit of a rebellious panel. Um, so the the, the core. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully we'll get to to, to that point. But that you know, the core point of productivity with um, yeah. AI generally, and I don't know if you've personally. Is it loud enough just to keep going? <laughs> I don't know if you've personally. Yeah, the Zoom people. Yeah, it's on. It's on though. It's on. It's on. <laughs> you turned it off. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. Yeah, I know. Yeah, oh, I've only done this 400 times. Anyway, so look, from a productivity perspective, any of you out there that are playing, have played around with some of the tools, um, I highly recommend that you do. It's actually it's many, a fascinating have, time. I would say many in this room have played. Well, let's hope so. Yeah. Get stuck in. Get your hands yeah. dirty because it's a fascinating time just to stand back and watch big tech go at it with a number of enormous players actually delivering and underpinning the capabilities that have been generated. It sounds like you know about it very well. And the philosoph philosophical approach to sort of centralization versus decentralization, which has ever been forever been a thing across the internet. I think it's just fantastic. Um, but in terms of productivity, I can only think, particularly with my old adopts head on, that I just want people to do what humans should be doing and not spend two thirds of their time creating the insights, but actually utilizing, analyzing, and uh, leveraging the insights um, that are possible. And that's something that's so exciting from a producti productivity perspective. You can kind of scale through repetition and delegation and just have people doing what they ought to be doing um, and whilst there's a fear in terms of skills, if I'm honest, in the in, in our industry, particularly at the, at the sort of uh, more operational and programmatic um, roles, that's something that people have had to be evolving throughout their time to exist. You're going to have to do different roles. You're going to have to upskill. You had to have a learning mindset, and I can only see that as being positive. However, in terms of how brands and industry leverages this, there is precedence of this going both right and wrong. So you mentioned sort of automated content that that problem existed in a, in a big way about 10 years ago with a company called Demand Media that could knock out um, automated pages of content text base um, before the search algorithms caught up and they made a lot of money out of it um, and it was pretty much non-human generated. So that that's that's something that's only going to get worse if that mediocre kind of cookie 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 cutter approach is taking place in terms of content, let alone the ads that you're experiencing that can be automated to such an extent um, and then optimized to the nth degree. It's it's going to be very hard to manage the quality of that whilst it's great to embrace the um, benefits of automation. And with ad fraud, we've just produced a handbook on it. That, that's another um, issue altogether because it's an arms race in which I only feel that these capabilities will be more of a problem than part of the solution. Uh, Charmaine or Richard on either this question of generative AI and or um, responsible AI? Ex responsible, explainable, observable? Yeah. <laughs> oh, what have we done to it? <laughs> Just testing. So this, so we test and learn is what we uh, you know, live by. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of really bad ads uh, right. in the short term. And I, I know this would be concerning Charmaine particularly, but uh, generative AI is going to produce terrible ads for a long time. So in the short term, <laughs> I see that being the biggest problem. Mm. Um, I, I work with a lot of uh, data analysis tools that have built in, uh, you know, machine learning and AI insights and they're, they're, I'm sure a lot of people in this room have some exposure to that as well. And you'd be really comfortable in your jobs because you've seen how poor the level of insight those tools provide. Um, so fr from a practitioner standpoint, I'm not seeing anything yet which is going to change dramatically the right. over the next few years in terms of unless the level of um, insight that these you know tools can provide improves dramatically it's going to be business as usual with maybe some efficiencies in terms of how we work and how we do things uh, I think it will be bad if we if we hand over too much of the creative reins to um, generative AI techniques uh, one example I, I think one of the things presented earlier was talking around using generative AI to to basically not not pay a model to you know model clothes for Levi's and that's right 
you know, brands going out there wanting to, to talk about diversity and representation, but using AI as a shortcut for that is right. quite... It's already happening. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's problematic. So I think we need to be holding brand market, you know, marketers and brands to account for, for that kind of thing because it's, they don't get it if they're trying to use those solutions to address that problem. Right. Um, so yeah, it's, it's probably a bit of a minefield. Shani? Um, as someone who has the great pleasure of working with you know, some of the best talent in the industry, me using chat GPT doesn't make me a copywriter. And I think you know, me or someone like me or a lookalike of me um, doesn't um, you know, make someone a, a great um, ad creator. I think what I'm really excited about is a couple of examples of amazing creatives using um, CGI and generative AI to create phenomenal, creatively impactful ads. There's two examples recently. One was um, it's gone viral in the last week of Maybelline. Um, so for a mascot are a brand and they actually the creatives used icons around um, London and they added sort of you know comically large um, eyelashes onto all of these icons and had large installations of their um, mascara adding you know lashes onto the London tube etc um, what's interesting about that is they actually used out of home which is you know a creatively sort of impactful thing that we love to use as creatives as well but did it in a CGI in a generative sort of way um, another one was the French fashion house Jacquemus um, who took their micro mini bags and blew them up to sort of the, the scale of a car and had them you know going all around Paris and all around these different sort of iconic um, places so those two examples I go that is so creative impactful that is amazing for the brand um, you can just imagine the creators back at the agency being like you know it would have cost us three million dollars to make this but we've made it with generative CGI and, and AI as well so I think that there is amazing ways that you can harness these tools once you get industry leading incredible people working on them at that top of the funnel level um, but otherwise it's going to be as I said before a lot of Cluedo ads, you'll start to see them, you know, where, where it is just those distinctive assets being kind of moved in and out, but in the right hands, just in the way that Photoshop and um, ad tech has, you know, helped and enhanced the creativity as a tool. I think in the right hands, you can make incredibly creatively impactful things with this in the right way. Can I go? Because um, we're going to run out of time, so I want to kind of focus our attention on um, on this one big important question, and then go to some of the questions coming in from the audience. But um, the, to kind of pick up on Jean's uh, question about, you know, we've been trying to build this ad observatory because we have this question about how to make digital advertising more observable, more explainable. And I think, as Jean pointed out, we um, we um, share some interests here in that, you know we have our reasons why we want advertising more explainable and observable but advertisers and the ad industry in general wants that too because you've found platforms to be opaque and richard you've talked a little bit about that this morning already um so i, I wanted to ask you you know what what kinds of explainability do you think are really important for the industry and the public and if, if you were building an ad observatory that was kind of fit for purpose over the next 10 years like what's the what's the killer feature or what's the killer aspect that it needs just um but um, so I'll ask you to make your kind of sharp answer to that so I can go to some of these questions. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So I think in that one, if you look at the, um, it, the study presented by Lauren, it'd be interesting to see that you have all of, I was interested to see if there was all of the actions of, of the users included in there in terms of what had actually been viewed, what the clicks looked like, what any post purchase and, and all of that. I think if, if you could, it, if, I was just wondering if it was beyond delivery. You know, I just that was one thing to consider, and ultimately, with the changes that are coming and the privacy proposals that have been mentioned around um, consumer privacy, that you have to weave the concept of consent into that. And I'd love there to be an industry-led discussion with government around how we can manage the informing consumers and empowering them and then adhering to any of their consent preferences in a consistent, persistent, and responsible way throughout their internet experiences here in Australia so that we can just do a lot better than what we've seen in Europe and in parts of the US to, to really sort of drive forward a, a better um, environment for advertising generally in, in digital. I'd love that to be part of the experimentation. Cool. Yep. Uh, Richard, yeah. I would say scale and spend. So I right. think greater visibility on how much is being spent on mm -hmm. what, uh, and I guess as a, as a consumer understanding how much is being uh, spent to how much you're worth 
you know, to, to a platform or an advertiser would be really interesting. Yeah. Jean, do you want to ask this question too? Well, um, from some of our research on the explainability tools that are offered to consumers by Meta, such as the why am I seeing this ad thing, which many people probably don't know exists, many mm. consumers aren't interested in. Um, it's, we've just been really struck by how very limited it is to only have um, an individual and time-bound view of mm. why a particular ad has been served to you. And it seems to me that connects really well. Whereas, uh, so you'll never know if you're uh, if you tend to receive um, a lot of ads that places you as in an association or a group um, with another, mm. uh, you know, with another whole cohort of people, or um, and you'll never know if you're being um, targeted or you know persistently served with alcohol advertising every Friday night when you've got a drinking problem. Right. So um, it's that thing about um, scale across the population and over time. Charmaine. Mm -hmm. I think um, what, you know, in, in searching for the Venn diagram of what, what's great for brands and advertisers and what's you know, great for the work that you do and, and citizens as a whole, I think the thing that was quite shocking to me um, was the ad sequences that Lauren was talking about. So where you're served um, multiple different category advertising in the same burst. Mm. So from an advertiser perspective, that's really bad planning because it's in such a cluttered environment, right? right? But it's also terrible for the actual person that's receiving such a volume of those ads as well. So in traditional broadcast media, you would never get that same category clutter. So, you know, Channel 9 is never going to place mm. you with um, three or four or five of your competitors back to back and call that sort of an, an effective ad placement for you as well. So I think that um, looking at uh, caps um, on, you know, that it's not 100% alcohol advertising, maybe that's capped at 20% or maybe that's, you know, there's harmful advertising that's, you know, particular categories that should be capped as well. But there is a meeting of the interests of the advertiser for that volume of clutter, for the effectiveness of that ad, but also, you know, the, the citizen that's actually receiving that volume as well. Right. Uh, we're almost at time, but we did start a couple of minutes late, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take a little bit of yeah. I've been given the all clear on that. That's good. Um, so I'm gonna go with a couple of upvoted questions uh, here. I'm gonna go firstly with uh, a question from Casey, which is um, is political advertising also tilting back in the direction of focusing on reach and brand marketing and becoming less hyper targeted? Do you have a, a Richard? I'll go to you on this one. Do a bit of work in political advertising uh, for for one of the major parties, and it's it's not. There's still a, a very kind of targeted approach, and there's there is reasons for that, obviously, in terms mm. of they don't certain messages only being relevant in certain electorates, and and wanting to be really targeted about that. Uh, it's not the it's definitely not happening at the the scale and sophistication that we've seen historically. But there is there is definitely a very targeted approach, and it's it's the last uh, few I guess state elections um, that we've seen around the country. There's probably been some some really, uh, without saying too much, some some really significant shifts in the way that advertising has been bought to be to be uh, probably a bit bit smarter than it has been in the past. Right. Can I go to um, a quote? This kind of came up briefly as we were going along, but the, you know, in Australia we have the Privacy Act Review, which is part of a larger set of international developments around privacy law and regulation, um, and it recommended a legal right to opt out of targeted ads. Uh, you know, how, to what extent is this being discussed, and to what extent would it impact the industry if if we went that way? To opt out or opt in? Opt that's out. the yeah. Well, that's the, right. the thing, right? Because it's whether they're saying opt out. They're saying opt out because that's actually the current model so as yeah. far as i know you can i mean if, actually we, we give the wall gardens a hard time but if you look at the privacy choices you have within some of the the major players it's actually exceptional you can see the companies that upload you as part of their custom audiences um and opt out of those you can control what, what you will or won't want to see i mean it's an effort i'm not i'm not saying that it isn't but there are controls in there in the current um situation as far as i know is is op opt out and whilst it's not as clear as it could be, as I mentioned earlier, I think that's part of the work that we need to do to actually make it more, to give the consumers more control and awareness around what, what they've got and then adhere to those, those preference and, and act more responsibly. Mm. Um, Charmaine, I might go to you on this question because it picks up a little bit on the observation you made about Lauren's, you know, that sequence of alcohol ads. Like it's from an advertiser point of view, that's not a good 
that's that's a cluttered placement. Yeah. Um, and there's a question here that I think goes along that the, along those lines around the relationship between advertisers and platforms, and it's pointing to some of the historically issues we've seen around, um, y you know. Um, Facebook having to report, you know, faulty video metrics a few years ago and YouTube having similar issues. And to what extent has that really affected trust between the industry and platforms? And where does that sit in terms of, you know, advertisers trusting and feeling like they have a good capacity to control their placements and understand the metrics and feedback they're getting from platforms? It, it was, um, there was a, a strange period of time where um, digital was really ramping up, but a, a lot of reach a lot of people were still in traditional and there was such a stark contrast between the reach metrics that you would get um, from broadcasters um, and traditional media and digital media as well and so it was it's sort of night and day in terms of what you could could see and um, how it was reported I think for me personally I what I didn't feel huge amounts of um, blowback on the kind of trust implications right. of that because you're looking at the data that I can see on these platforms versus 17 other different platforms that I can get as well and yes there was a blip there yes there was an issue there but can I still get more visibility and more data there than I can across maybe 10 of the other platforms that I'm looking at um, yes um, so for me personally it wasn't it didn't have a huge impact on the trust and the efficacy um, of the platforms as well but you know it did did make people sit up and take a right. lot of notice and it was looked at for a long period of time i feel like you might have yeah yeah <clears throat> i mean the, the the big part of the issue there was brand safety right the the lack right. of control around where the appropriate contextual environments that your brand was potentially playing in um there's been a lot of there's been a lot of maturity as a result and looking more towards inclusion lists versus exclusion lists or just leveraging better technologies to ensure that your brand is in in the place that you're happy to see it depending upon your appetite for risk and that varies all different brands and agencies have their own media quality approaches but the capabilities there i think have massively improved and that is another risk of what could happen with ai too in terms of figuring that out because it was interesting when we went through the process as an industry body and i think it the time I was on the board and working at a brand that was buying and selling was actually the lack of the lack of companies and brands that are actually even quite large ones that had stood back and gone what is our approach to media quality and what 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 is our lev level of appetite for risk that we're prepared to accept it's quite quite amazing really we okay one more question because there's two questions and they're getting upvoted a lot here <laughs> they're the same kind of question <laughs> which is to what extent are some of the ethical issues that have been raised today discussed within you know adland within the industry um be it greenwashing or more broadly uses of data and so on so you know what kind of discussions about advertising ethics and responsibility are kind of going on are really lively in the industry from my perspective uh probably not uh, enough or as much as it, they should be um and it, it, as a for a general statement uh advertise advertisers uh, want to do the right thing but aren't necessarily uh, well informed about how to do the right thing or where they might be you know making mistakes and, and potentially making mistakes um, particularly when thinking about audiences the data that they share um, you know things like how profiling an audience for your customers could be could be profiling uh, addiction and then creating a look-like audience on people that have mm -hmm. Are likely to, to to be addicted and maybe aren't even addicted yet and it, it's just a, a real ethical pitfall right and yeah. I, I can tell you that there's not a, from a marketer perspective there's not a huge amount of thought going into that there's much more focus on other things yeah but it's um it, it probably needs to from my perspective needs to be, yeah. be more than it is can I jump in quick? because actually there is a lot if you can lean in i'm not saying that you're not necessarily but there is right now a response required to a d an ethics a data ethics in ai um piece of work that has been that i know we're preparing a response for there has been a response to the, the some of the gambling topics that have come up that's something that we've put together a collaborative response to um if you look at the work in and around data ACCC this week um a request around more information on data brokerages 
um, which is going to be less operational than the Attorney General's um, submission requests for the, the potential policy changes there. But this is all part of being able to lean in. And I suppose that's a lot of what we do naturally. So that it depends, I suppose, how much resource and time you have to be able to commit to those collaborative efforts that are happening pan industry. Um, but there's, there, I think there's a lot um, of engagement there. I suppose it's a question of what that ends up looking like, admittedly. And it needs to be a representative group that's responding to that, not just sort of publisher heavy or buyer heavy or whatever. Thank you, Jonas. We are out of time. So I want to thank Jonas, Richard, Jean, Charmaine, and Christine Sassar-Lauren uh, for this morning's panel. Thank you all.